you, we, we start to look at that neck as being a not just a local problem but a whole body problem and being able to check um, if we got better pronation in that right foot or better supination in that left foot or more rotation of the pelvis can does that liberate the neck to move more freely more easily um, and so there is a whole assessment process to to getting to that point um, but technically every single bone is speaking to every other bone simultaneously it would appear through the nervous system which is your specialty um, but we should be able to dictate and predetermine it through just through joint surface and structure itself I'm Garrett Saulpeter, and I believe that the most powerful and transformative way to help people recover from pain and injury, heal from trauma, and reach their highest levels of fitness and performance is to focus on the nervous system. In this podcast, we'll share knowledge from the frontiers of neuroscience and inspirational stories of how applying that knowledge has empowered people from all walks of life to heal, adapt, and grow. Welcome to this episode of the Undercurrent Podcast. I'm joined today by Gary Ward coming to us from Anatomy in Motion and all the way from London, England. Thank you, Gary, for being here. Thank you, Garrett. What an intro. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm really excited for this because I have actually had the, the privilege of learning from you, uh, at least through, you know, through your book and some online courses and some of your materials. And I just uh, really am excited about how well your work complements NewFit and how you know, the, the philosophies and the work just really goes well together. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. And just to, to introduce yourself to our audience, can you please let everyone know a little bit about your company, Anatomy, Anatomy in Motion, and how you got into the work that you're doing now? Um, yeah, absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, first, I just wanted to say um, it's great to speak to someone on the other side of the online material that we've produced, which we'll get back to in a bit, but um, mostly uh, our podcasts are with people who are curious about the work and don't haven't any experience or are people who've been through the process. So I feel like you're kind of in the middle somewhere and we, you're actually someone we've been able to reach online and, um, and, and it's been seemingly effective and you've enjoyed it enough to come this far. So <laughs> I will, I will give it a shout out here. So I heard about you actually through uh, one of our, uh, one of our practitioners that, that has the newbie is a guy named Bert Massey, who's really a lot of good knowledge on the feet. We'll actually we'll have him on here too, but get, give a shout out to Bert for that. I do recognize Bert's uh, name actually. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so um, anatomy and motion and me. Uh, well, um, I started Anatomy in Motion in 2006 or 2007 um, and ran my first courses in, in 2007. Um, but my introduction to the feet, which is really where all of this started with zero anatomical um, knowledge, was when I lived and worked in the French Alps um, in the ski resorts. Uh, and was super lucky enough to be taught by a few guys about how to fit a ski boot. And um, it, it, I had no idea. I mean, I used to uh, weight train and read Flex magazine, which had all the big bodybuilders and stuff like that. And um, so that was my insight into, into anatomy. And um, all of a sudden there was this thing called the foot um, and it was bony and it sat in my hand on this little plastic model and um and i was being shown how we're going to reorganize this foot to be comfortable in a ski boot and everybody who's skied knows that ski boots are hell on earth <laughs> not very comfortable most people wear them two sizes too big and we were going to be the precision experts um starting in about a week's time <laughs> so um we had some really intense trainings um i heard words like pronation and supination and um lifting toes to lift arches and building orthotics. And, and um, it was, it was a, a phenomenal learning experience and one that I just connected with immediately. So uh, when I went out to the ski resorts, I was not fully intending to, uh, you know, leave them being um, obsessed with anatomy, but that, that's exactly what happened. So, um, if you've listened to my any other our, our podcasts, you'll you'll have heard me say this countless times. But 
it was it was very very clear to me that one of two things would happen if you made an adjustment to somebody's feet in their ski boot and the, on the on the one hand their first response was that they their performance just improved that day i've never skied like that before people would come back to the shop i mean we're literally on the hill so they would leave come back and say my performance i've never skied like that before you know unbelievable thank you love my new boots okay wow that's amazing and on the other hand people would come back and say i didn't have any back pain today when i skied can you explain that and of course i was in absolutely no position to explain that but it <laughs> happened again and again and again so they, um i was with lots of other boot fitters it wasn't just me um but i was the one who just went i need to be able to explain that answer i need to be able to know how that has made a difference like your foot and your back are miles apart right um you don't go to the gym and train foot and back together <laughs> you just in fact what the hell was the foot i didn't even know it was that we had one until it went inside the ski boot and um the uh so yeah i was super curious and um, i did that for i was working with ski boots for six to seven years um and in the process i did a course to become a personal trainer and in that course, I learned about as much as I had learned from reading Flex magazine, so nothing more. Um, and I even gave a talk on the foot during that course because the guy who was attempting to do it was doing such a bad job. <laughs> so, and he turned around to me at the end and said, that was very good. I think I learned something today. <laughs> so um, I guess I was always destined to, to deliver information and talk about feet, but I was, I li am, am, not even was, am literally obsessed with with this as a structure and um have witnessed enough um let's put in inverted commas the word magic when you work with people's feet to to interact with and affect the rest of the body so it was not something that i could walk away from um and still still haven't so um 2000 and seven was ran the first course we've been through many iterations through to um you know different ways of attempting to get the material across obviously since 2007 the material has honed got stronger i have much more understanding around the work than i did back then um and um was lucky enough not no not lucky enough i, I wrote a book in 2013 called what the foot and um, that was a simple, there it is, thank there you very much, uh, a simple outpouring of what I felt like I needed to tell people, I was going to say the world, um, but it's now like the world, but I needed to tell people that there's a different way of thinking, that movement is, is different to what we might think it is, that... Um, we can apply some rules to movement to help us think consistently and clearly around around what it is. And um, I called the foot the forgotten body part because, like I said, I, I did a whole course and there was it, it wasn't touched on. I've since spoken to physiotherapists and osteopaths who um, have also said the same. It was kind of always left till the end. It pronates, it supinates, it's, that's it, move on. <laughs> and... Um, it, it um, the book itself created that platform. So more courses, but thankfully it gave me the step to um, begin to teach uh, globally. So I've been on the road traveling since 2014, teaching in America, teaching in Australia, teaching around Europe, um, England and Ireland, and uh, attracting people traveling to join us from Hong Kong, if we go to somewhere like Lisbon to teach in Portugal, we'd have people coming from, from Asia, from America, from South America, just so people would come everywhere. In fact, people came from everywhere except where we held the course. That was always the <laughs> like people, I didn't know you were here, but everybody else had found out. So um, we attracted a, a global audience, but I still think the work is, is niche. Um, and the niche part of it is the, is the real story, which is the flow motion model. Um, and so as a skier uh, and understanding the feet and the movement in feet and um, I remember sitting on a chairlift one day watching someone ski and I said I said to myself they just look like they're walking down the hill left foot goes in front of right foot and 
they were doing this doing this thing and i know like skiing doesn't feel like walking but it, i just had this thing anyway the curiosity how does the foot help the back there must be a connection so when i move my foot what happens to my ankle what happens to my knee or does that have an impact on my hip is it predictable is it determinable um can i break that rule no i can't so we don't want a movement like that we do want a movement like that and then somebody would come in to for a session and they get pain and you can see that they're attempting to do a movement that they shouldn't do so we teach them to do a movement that they could and, and then their pain would clear up and they'd feel much better uh, because we were created a, an environment where they're own physical structures weren't butting into each other but they were working together um, and um, the model became what I just called the flow motion model it was actually me evolving into a space where we worked out the movement of every single bone and joint in all three dimensions through a single footstep so every single bone and joint not just the feet the pelvis the vertebrae collarbone uh, everything so we get a, a whole picture of how the whole body walks um, through a single footstep. And it turns out that it's quite different to the standard understanding and appreciation of gait. So there are certain gait models that, that people like to follow. Um, and for me, they more likely follow the way somebody walks rather than the way somebody should walk. And there's a, there's a huge difference. There. So if you... Um, if you put markers on somebody and mark up the way they walk, you will get certain readings, certain amount of degrees of rotation in uh, in somebody's hip or uh, in their spine. And they'll say that the foot pronates in this place. And um, and actually, if you if you then take an interest in how the anatomy should move and question that, you end up in a, with a very different structure and a very different shape. But interestingly, some of the rules of biomechanics, if you like, that do exist are present in the model. And then some of the rules that don't exist are also present in the model. So you get a huge array of insight into what's possible at different joints. What's possible, for instance, you can flex a hip and posterior tilt a pelvis in an open chain, but in the closed chain, you'll flex a hip and anterior tilt a pelvis. Does that mean that flexion of a hip is necessary to practice with both? Yes, of course it does. Uh, but you'll also find that there are movements that you just don't experience um, in the gait cycle uh, that if people are experiencing in real life correlates often to discomfort. And so the gait cycle became this really interesting indicator of what our bones would like to do, can do, should do. Um, and not just about a hip, but about that hip and its relationship to the structures below it, the structures above it, the structures below that and, and above that. And, and so it, it really became a hugely holistic insight into the movement capabilities of the human body rather than an isolated look at how a joint moves uh, because we've all we, we can all go to school and and learn how a joint moves and in fact we're lucky enough to work with personal trainers physical therapists uh, known as physios here in the uk osteopaths chiropractors dance coaches, um, doctors, sports coaches, um, fascia workers. Um, and if you ask them to dorsiflex their ankle, they'll all lift their leg up, pull their toes up. Um, if you ask them to abduct their leg, they'll take that, take that leg away the, into the air. So they do everything closed chain and every single one of them, regardless of discipline, is trained to think about movement in, that, in the same way. So all of a sudden, what we're now looking at is when we're interested in when that foot's on the ground, because if I if I abduct my leg, take my foot out to the side while standing on my left leg and take the right out to the side and say that's a hip abduction because I've taken it away from my body. We've not we've nothing needs to happen below the hip. But when you abduct a hip with the foot on the ground, you need the toe to move, the forefoot to move, the rear foot to move, the ankle to move, the knee to do something three dimensions of movement at the hip, three dimensions of movement at the foot. And all of a sudden, a hip abduction is a very, very different conversation. Um, and to take, and our goal has always been to take people from that, what's happening at a hip when it abducts to what happens to the whole, effectively, body when it abducts. And it's not, obviously, it's not just, I'm using abduction as one example of, of many arrangements here. So um, the model 
effectively tells us when your hip should abduct, when it should adduct, what shape the rest of the body will take on when it adducts, when the foot pronates, when it supinates, how many stages of, of movement does it take to do a supination, what's the role of the toe, blah, 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 blah. And, and the critical piece of this understanding is to be able to then overlay that to a person. So I don't know if, uh, I always think of Mario Kart. Did you ever play Mario Kart? Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah, of course you did. Everyone has, this is a great analogy. You, when you would race around the track and you'd get your, you'd get two minutes and 14 seconds and then you'd go again and there'd be your little ghost buddy <laughs> and you've got to chase that ghost down and beat him. That's the flow motion model. So we have the way the body should work. That's the ghost. And then there's the way the person in front of you walks. And then you're looking at the two going, wow, he's supposed to be doing that, but he's actually doing that. And the essence of um, just, for instance, spending too much time on your left leg versus the right leg introduces huge timing delays so all of a sudden if i put my left leg forward and spend a lot of time there i have more rotation of a pelvis to the right when i took the right leg forward don't get it as far forward and don't spend as much time there i have very limited rotation to the left if i have limited rotation to the left i have limited counter rotation in the spine i have limited pronation in the right foot limited supination in the left foot maybe limited knee extension maybe excess knee flexion um, and, and you're able to kind of somehow make note of all these things. And we can see effectively that you actually, we just need to teach you to be better at putting that right leg forward, supinating that left foot, pronating the right foot, rotating the pelvis, counter rotating the spine and create movements for people to experience all of those things at once. Um, so that's the type of experience we want to give to people. And that person might have neck pain but instead of treating their neck, cracking the neck or doing neck stretches, you, we, we start to look at that neck as being a, not just a local problem, but a whole body problem and being able to check um, if we got better pronation in that right foot or better supination in that left foot or more rotation of the pelvis, can does that liberate the neck to move more freely, more easily? Um, and so there is a whole assessment process to, to getting to that point. Um, but technically every single bone is speaking to every other bone simultaneously it would appear through the nervous system which is your specialty um, but we should be able to dictate and predetermine it through just through joint surface and structure itself if you're ready to supercharge your practice listen to this Garrett and Team NewFit have just released a new online course entitled Introduction to the NewFit Method. In this detailed eight-hour course, you'll gain mastery of the fundamental techniques in our practice, including muscle testing and activations, nerve glides, and joint articulations. You'll also get introduced to our patented direct current stimulation device, the Newbie, an incredible machine that's empowered professionals just like you to help their patients heal, adapt, and grow faster than they ever thought possible. To learn more, go to www.neu.fit. learn and now back to the show. That's that's awesome. Thank you for that overview. And I, I mean, really like that perspective. I mean, one, you, you know, you started with the importance of the feet and how they're so often overlooked and ignored. Um, and you know, we'll we'll dive in a little deeper mm -hmm. on the feet as well. Um, and then just to underscore for everyone that that the difference in in anatomy in, you know, closed chain versus open chain and in, 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 in gate, I think is a wonderful unifying framework for understanding that because it's something we're all familiar with. And it really has all of the movements that we're interested yeah. in for, for proper human function. So. Absolutely. Um, and just to, you saying that makes me instantly drop in that um, we, we have a culture of stability and stabilizing stuff going on and when you are walking, nothing is stable. Nothing is still, everything needs to move. And if it doesn't, you end up in this exchange where if something is stabilized, it means it's actually moving less. And what you can't get away from is if you, if you let's say you've been guided to stabilize something, even if it's to, to brace your core and stop that lumbar vertebrae from moving, it, you, you lose your rotation, you lose different movement capacities at, at the spine. But th what's key is that that lack of movement at a certain place will always be brought up somewhere else because the chain is effectively closed as you just described. Now, some people will have closed chain, meaning I've got my foot on the ground 
for me, if the, if the chain is closed, it's complete. It's a, it's a full system. And if you take some part of that system and shut it down, another part of that system, in order to compensate for it, will just blow up and start moving. And, and ten, they tend to be, so I'm going to stabilize my spine, but all of a sudden, three months later, you've got knee pain because the only way to encourage movement, your knee starts moving excessively to make up for the lack of movement in the spine. Um, bunions are a classic example of that where... Um, the, the toes moving and moving and moving and moving probably for something else that isn't moving and you can track that through through the system through the model um, because bones basically just travel in directions so if I want something to go left but it can't something else will just go left more in order to in order to compensate for that which is it's a phenomenal phenomenal structure to be able to observe the body like that and then of course you've got injury where an injury has simply shut down an area of your body. You had it rehabbed, it feels better, but did you actually teach it to move well again? And if you didn't, what other parts of your body are making up for that now that, in, that is you know, gonna come back and bite you on the butt later in life? That's the, that's the million dollar question right there. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I love that. I love that framework for, for gait and you know, just agree with, with everything that you said. And, you know, one of the other things that you mentioned in the introduction to, to yourself and anatomy in motion is that you know, a lot of times people will be trying to you know, make movements that they can't and you teach them and, and very quickly by training their movements, you know, re retraining their movements are able to create shifts and help people with pain. And that's a framework that, you know, that we use a lot within the new fit methodology as well is, is giving people the right inputs and, and observing changes in outputs. Um, mm -hmm. can you, can you talk just for a moment about the, uh, the primary tool that you use to make, make some of those changes there? Cause it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. It's elegant in its simplicity. Uh, do you mean this triangular thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the AIM wedge. Um, so, um, a wedge is not a new thing. Uh, you can buy a, a yoga wedge 30 centimeters long. They have existed way, bef way before me. Um, um, and there are lots of bits of equipment that are built in with, with wedges to, to help people change angles. And in fact, um, orthotics um, quite readily use a, a wedge concept in, in, in the build. So if uh, if somebody, for instance, has a, a kind of varus forefoot or forefoot supinatus where they look like the forefoot is a bit inverted, um, and the problem with an inverted forefoot is when you put the weight on it is it collapses and looks like a flat foot. Um, one of the ways, and we would have done this in the ski boot as well, is you, you in order to stop that roll of the foot because of falling into the space that is being created beneath the ground and the, and the big toe, we would have filled it. Um, with material so the the idea then being that as soon as I apply pressure on my let's say I want to turn the ski right I'm going to put pressure into my left forefoot push the toe down now if I've got a time delay from the toe meeting the ground before it puts pressure on the ski before it turns uh, and we can reduce that by filling the space so that when my brain says turn I press on this onto the material which turns the ski it happens so much quicker um, therefore it's more effective more efficient but it's not necessarily teaching the, the structures to move. So I played around with this because when I was, if I wanted to uh, influence some, I mean, it happened haphazardly mostly, but it was just this idea of, I, it, I, I could just do with a wedge because that's what I would have done with an orthotic. And I'm thinking that I'm propping up their foot to help them in a lunge, for instance, as a personal trainer but recognizing that when that toe is now pressing in a barefoot environment on the wedge, and it's not an orthotic, so the wedge is not coming back up into the whole arch, minimizing movement through the whole arch. As soon as the pressure hits the, uh, the wedge instead of the ground, it has this huge articulating response behind it. So the foot continues its movement and it's blocked at the wedge, which would create this kind of, um, let me just see if I've got got the foot here so all of a sudden instead of instead of the foot rolling as a unit onto the ground it would meet the wedge 
and continue kind of the articulation happening underneath it. So all of the bones through the mid tarsals would, would, would experience their movement. So if you're, if you're listening on audio here, you're missing out on the visual, which is on the, the video version is on YouTube where Gary actually has a, a foot model up on the screen here, but just to, just in case you're listening, you have a little context, please Gary continue. <laughs> Jump to YouTube guys. <laughs> um, but like all the movement in the foot takes place around around the mid tarsals here because you know there's no joints in the metatarsals. You obviously have movement at the toes. Um, but if I if I jump onto a wedge, and I change the timing of of the contact, then I block that part of the foot and create movement in the rest of the foot. And interesting, in no, not interestingly, it is interesting. <laughs> but immediately, that habit of how my foot interacts with the ground is changed, and so the new movement in the bones new movement in the in the um, ligamentous tissues new movement in the muscular tissues um, new feedback responses in in proprioceptors and nervous system is and, and is the brain going is, is a new experience so we we're able to just like i talked about the mario kart and the the walking model is this is how a foot should move this is the shape it should adopt and then we can look at someone's foot and say um that's not how it should look. That's not how it should move. So what do we then do to give it that opportunity to experience? And as you said, re-educate the movement for it to, to relearn to move. And, and before going back to the wedges, there's, there's it's a, like a huge misnomer that you can't, if a foot's flat, then it's flat. But actually I, it's not true. And um, if a foot is flat, we can talk about, um, I know you wanted to talk about, about that pronation side of things, but if, if the foot is flat, then much like if a spine is side bent, you're going to have muscles that are long, muscles that are short. Um, and we can just reorganize those through the bony movement in order to stimulate the tissue for it to be less flat and more effective and have more input through the rest of the body. So it's ditching age old stories like this that are really going to move our industry forward rather than just... Um, let's just whack it on an orthotic or let's just try and strengthen the tissues because actually the just strengthening the tissues is also not necessarily teaching the bones to move. And that's really what my remit is. Um, the goal of my work is to, is to re-educate those bones to move. And so then we come back to a wedge um, and we know, we know that a foot again, I'm on the video guys, sorry, but we know that a foot, if you are listening, wants to has an, an eversion, an inversion, a plantar flexion of the rear foot, a dorsiflexion of the rear foot, a rotation of the rear foot, and the wedge is basically a slide. So if I would like to create an eversion in a rear foot, I can simply place that wedge on the outside of the heel, and when the person puts their weight on it, it will encourage it to go into an eversion direction. Same, if I want to create an inversion, I can create an inversion direction. We can create movement in the forefoot in all three dimensions and use the body itself as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a tool to, to help the foot get the most out of, its, um, out of its movement. So the thing that we're trying to do, as I briefly touched on there, is change the habit of movement. Because every what, one thing I used to work a lot on for, force plates uh, measuring uh, the outcome of somebody's foot movement, watching the journey of the center of pressure through the through the footprint, through the gait cycle, and um, what we noticed without any interaction is every footstep is you know, near as damn it the same. The one before, the one after, so the one last week, uh, the one 20 years ago, until somebody has gone in and put a new input into the foot, it's basically gonna perform the same footstep as it did everyone prior. So we recognize that movement is a behavior and movement is a habit. Um, and we know that those things rule our lives. And so unless we actually jump in and instigate a change somehow through um, a different input, um, and, and ours is to change the timing of the movement of the bones, the shape of the movement in the bones, the direction of the movement in the bones, the timing of the interaction on the ground, all of those things will start to input movement into the bones, which puts length and response into the tissues, um, but also can change the structure all the way up. So breaking those habits is a real, really key part to re-educating movement. And also because the foot is the only thing in contact with the ground when we're walking, to change the shape of that foot will will change. It's like having improved foundations in the building. It will change the alignment 
of structures going up. And as long as they can change, they will change. If they can't, they also probably need addressing, teaching to move um, or treat, um, et cetera. So we can slowly rebuild the house of cards that, that most people are, uh, are struggling with. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a great, great description of the wedges there. I appreciate that. And I think it, it's so interesting how, you know, we can talk about these subtle pronation and supination movements or, you know, that you're amplifying with the wedges. And I, I like the metaphor. It's kind of like a, it's like a megaphone. If I, if I say something, if I say something at a certain volume here, it can get amplified. And so over there, someone's going to hear it louder when the, when the foot, when the talus rotates internally, externally a couple of degrees, that can lead to more degrees of rotation in the tibia, even more in the femur, even more at the pelvis. And so yeah, working with the foot, it's like you get this wonderful leverage to make impacts biomechanically and neurologically. So the wedges, you know, just, I think it maybe just, I guess that adds a little bit to what, to what you're saying, but you know, yeah. about the, the power of the wedges, uh, and just another little little bit of a perspective on a way to understand it. Another thing you mentioned was flat feet. And I think this is really interesting uh, and I think would give, give the people listening some good insight into your thought process because tr traditionally, typically people would think, well, either, either one, no, I have flat feet, I can't do anything about it. Or two, they might think, oh, okay, well, there's, there's muscles that hold up the arch of the foot. So I want to train my, my, supinator muscles you know concentrically to get them stronger yeah. and and then uh you actually kind of recommend the opposite so can you can you talk a little bit a little it's bit about a, your, your, your first, perspective I'm, 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 not the first time i've heard it described like that um let's look uh, so we can do uh, many mediums and ways of um, focusing on a concentric contraction of tissue under the foot um, and the our idea there is that if I concentrically contract tissue under the foot, I'm going to create a foot supination. But I'd really like to underline that the specific requirement for movement in 26 bones and 33 joints of a foot to create a supination. That means that when you are concentrically contracting these tissues, if your bones are not able to go into the supinated shape, you are not training a supination. You're just working on tissue to be uh, stronger, tougher in the in the structural shape that it currently holds. So it's a really slow and long process. Um, it's not to say that concentric uh, exercises are bad for you, but to recognize that until your foot truly knows what a supination is, and, and I can tell you now that you can't supinate your foot unless you have appropriate movement in the fibula, appropriate movement in the knee, appropriate movement potential in the hip. There's a huge amount of, of, of restriction there. We're also on a hiding to nothing because the vast majority of, of us are um, pronated, as I was going to touch on, and collapsed towards the inside. The more time I spent like that, the less time I spend supinating. So it's a great idea to try and supinate your feet, but if you don't know how, it, it, it's... Um, you know the quote in Alice in Wonderland where she says to, uh, says to the... The cat says to her, which way, where are you going? And no, she says, which way should I go? And the cat says, where, that depends where you want to go. Where are you going? She says, I don't know. And he says, then it doesn't matter where you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Um, so it's a bit like that. It's like, if you're going to supinate your foot, then actually need to learn the position uh, to, a, to, or the work to do to get your foot to adopt a supinated position. In the same breath, if you're going to teach your foot to pronate, you probably need to know how the bones are going to fall into a pronation. Um, it's in, and it's not straightforward, but the good news is given there's 33 joints and 26 bones is there are only two shapes that that foot would like to make. And so our goal is simply to, to train it, to re-educate it, to be able to access both. Um, now, when I pronate my foot, um, we're looking at a flexed ankle, flexed knee, flexed hip scenario. When I supinate my foot, I'm looking at a plantar flexed ankle, extended knee, extended hip scenario. And so it is not just a foot conversation, but a whole leg conversation. It's a whole body conversation. It always is. Um, 
And I just wanted to underline that because I know a lot of people are pro supination exercises. But if your foot can't access a proper supinated shape, then you are effectively wasting your time, in my opinion. And um, I'm quite black and white about stuff like that. So what does it involve to supinate the foot? The, the, around the question that you asked me, um, um, and initially you, you framed it as, firstly, pronation is deemed as evil. It's bad. We don't want to do it. It creates a valgus knee. It needs an orthotic. It needs stabilizing. It needs propping up. We've already had the stabilizing conversation. And then I come along and say, pronation is probably the one of the most important movements in your body. Supination is equally as important. We've already just had that little chat. But if we, mit, if we bypass pronation, we literally bypass 90% of muscle tissue in, in the foot. And the interesting part is that um, if you critically analyze the muscles of the foot, you will very soon come to recognize that the vast majority of them are supinators. And the fact that they're supinators means that they experience length when the foot is pronating. And I have a rule that I wrote about in the book, what the foot is that muscles lengthen before they contract. So to travel a foot from a neutral position into a pronated position will put length into all of those tissues. And the longer those tissues get, and the more pronated the foot gets, the more stimulus there is in that tissue to suddenly contract. So the contraction of supination happens from a pronated position not a neutral position to a supinated position. And that's that. I think that's where we can have that same conversation around the glutes. So your glutes don't contract from neutral to extended. They actually contract from flexed to extended. So we change our mindset from a mid range to end range to even a flexed range to fully extended range. That's the whole journey of, of the muscle. Now, looking at the foot, they, you, we're looking peroneus longus, anterior tib, uh, plantar fascia, um, tibialis posterior, uh, soleus, um, even, even both extensors and flexors are all managing, uh, they're a, a managing pronation. They're allowing the foot bones to pronate, controlling and decelerating that amount of pronation in the bones, and then creating a contraction that would pull the bones back into their opposite direction to generate that second shape called supination at which point there's a significant am amount of detail, particularly down the lateral border relationship between the fourth and fifth metatarsals and the cuboid, cuboid and the calcaneus, uh, fibula, et cetera, are all necessarily, um, necessary for that movement. But pronation is passive. So when I put my foot on the ground, my hope, literally, <laughs> is that the foot itself will fall into a nice pronation. Um, and it starts with... Um, having a tripod on the ground, fifth metatarsal, first metatarsal, and calcaneus. If we can get all those three structures on the ground and the foot lengthens and spreads, all of those muscles get to experience the, the lengthening, which will trigger the contraction and encourage it to narrow and shorten again as we, as we, as we kind of bring that leg underneath us and step forward um, to the point where we should have what's known as a rigid lever, a full supination at the back foot when the toes just prior to the toes leaving the ground. And that's what propels us forward. So if you can imagine that rigid lever, that full, um, full supinated foot shape with a straight leg behind you and your body being propelled forward, hip extension, hip abduction, uh, hip external rotation, that is when the glutes are short and they've finally made it to a, to a good short position. If you're unable to complete that supination movement, like we discussed before, you're unable to extend your knee like we did before, then your glutes are never going to get that full activity, in which we know they don't. Most people really struggle to activate their glutes, feel their glutes. But we just said that in order to get a good extension in my hip and good activation of my glutes, we need to go to that extension flexion conversation again. Mm -hmm. and so when the foot's forward on its tripod, lengthening and widening, that's when your hip is most flexed, flexed, adducted, femur internally rotating is going to put the most length into the glute tissue. That is when the glute kind of recognizes, whoa, we can't, can't go any more in this direction. We're going to have to slow down that movement, generate a contraction and pull that hip through the contraction into its extension, abduction and external rotation while the knee goes from bent to straight and the foot goes from pronated to supinated. So foot pronation and glute activity are incredibly closely connected and foot supination, glute 
full full loaded full hip extension and also therefore things like hip flexor load and length um, they, you can see how they all play a really beautiful part in in this footstep so if, if you reframe the tissue the role of tissue tissue is set up perfectly to both allow movement to take place and to control that movement and and bring it back so all movement actually is away from a neutral position and the muscle's role is to stop it going away from a neutral position and contract it back towards and therefore through the neutral position in order to develop um, actual movement through through a neutral not full stop that because a lot of people we, we think about neutral as being an anatomical holy grail but for me it's actually the ability to move away from it back to it beyond it again and of course when i go beyond if i'm if my tissues of hip extension are bringing my hip uh, into extension then all of a sudden the tissues of flexion they have to then have their time to decelerate that extension and then contract to bring forward again from extension back into flexion there's a huge amount of momentum involved there's a huge amount of passive movement involved um, and it really leads me onto the second rule that I wrote about in the book and talk about in the programs is the joints act muscles react conversation so we live in a world where everybody's a bit obsessed with muscles teach the muscle stimulate the muscle contract the muscle but when you really get the bones to do what they're supposed to do and go into the places they're supposed to go, they do actually give muscles no option but to contract. And so there's a really beautiful relationship uh, between the two. Um, and that's where I'm very keen that we get we, we look at both and we don't just obsess about one. That's a beautiful description. Thank you for sharing that. And it's it's uh, I like that how you brought in the the hip and how how the glute and its relationship in decelerating pronation, how, how that's not only relevant, but that's, you know, that, that adequate pronation oh, supination is a requirement. It's a prerequisite for, yeah. for glutes to function appropriately. Yeah, and, if you jump Garrett to uh, gym based work of glute bridges, glute extension, hip extensions, hip abductions, if, if you aren't thinking about the foot, it, it's great work in the gym. It feels good in the tissue, but it carry over to walking. Mm -hmm. If the foot is ignored, it, it, you know, you, it, it, it will drop off really, really quickly because the brain will just revert back to habit. And if the habit is one of the same footstep occurring over and over again, but that footstep not appearing to have a good pronation or a good supination, then the tissues that you've just worked on in the gym for an hour suddenly have nothing to do again. And yeah. that's the long game that people are playing, unfortunately. Now, I like that your information and this framework and, you know, the elements of the work that that we're both doing i think are able to help to kind of turn that turn that framework upside down maybe something that's a little more healthy and productive here um, yeah. so it's i was once accused garrett of being an upside down thinker <laughs> i i wondered if, i wondered which one of us actually was but there you go <laughs> that's that's that it's a good thing you know sometimes yeah. you need to look at things from a different perspective <laughs> yeah i like to think that we've looked at it from all angles actually Yes. Yes. Quite literally. Yes. Um, so for, for people who are listening, if they're intrigued in learning more about you or if they've seen us learning the wedges and they like the things that they've heard from you here today, uh, what's the best place for people to find you either on the web, social media? Um, personally, the um, social media channel that I enjoy using is Instagram. Uh, which is um, at Gary Ward underscore AIM. And um, we also, everything I post on there is also posted up to Facebook, which is a, a, a group page, I think, called um, Facebook. So facebook.com forward slash anatomy in motion. Um, and then there is the website, which is called Finding Center, spelled the uh, English way, C E N T R E dot co dot uk and and on there under the tab of aim education you'll find the closed chain biomechanics of the lower limb course um, and soon to have the closed chain biomechanics of the upper body course um, and also there are the less expensive options um, not that i think that's expensive but we also offer self-assessment programs called wake your feet up and wake your body up and and those programs are aimed at people not therapists so your clients patients 
um, anybody who has problem with the body. So even therapists who have a problem with their body may want to undergo this as a, as a kind of introductory process first, whereby we teach them to, to look at the movements, to assess their body in this way, to take uh, consideration of previous injuries and begin to try and unravel their own problem because I'm a big proponent of people taking ownership of their own body rather than from both sides, rather than heading to a therapist in the vain hope that they can fix you. My, my actual insight is that the, the therapist can shine a light on your problems, but you are the person who ultimately has to deal with them. So the better information you have to deal with it, the more likely you're going to have a good outcome. And uh, from the therapist's point of view, um, a lot of therapists <laughs> would come on courses um, and the amount of responsibility they've taken for their clients is actually really stressful. Um, and to be able to take that pressure away and help the client and be a team with the client and have the, the client take ownership of their own body rather than rely on the therapist to be the fixer has been a huge um, breath of fresh air for many people. So these programs are designed to help people um, so for instance, don't go to the podiatrist and expect to get an orthotic, but try to understand your, nothing against podiatrists, that wasn't the point of that statement, <laughs> but simply to, to go, right, well, I have an opportunity here to one, understand the movement of my feet, learn some ways of moving my feet, use the wedges to help um, organize those structures differently and, and see how that affects me and, and my body. And then, of course, it's a lifelong tool and you're able to use that tool for, um, forevermore to to reorganize your feet keep working your feet watch your knees straighten out get more activity around your hips um, and because the sad part of going and getting the orthotic is you're actually going to miss out on all of that the orthotic becomes the crutch and the plaster that you put on the problem rather than getting to the bottom of the problem and that's really what what we would like to do with these programs so in a nutshell, two programs to help you with your body um, and we've got the first online installment of our course uh, that we've been teaching around the world and we've we're going to build on that over time to bring more courses to be able to bring the education in these um, challenging locked away times <laughs> to, to help people continue um, learning about anatomy and uh, hopefully it's something that people enjoy fabulous well, I've, I've been through some of your material and uh, can can vouch for the fact that it's excellent excellent education and um, you know, we're excited to see more and more new fit practitioners uh, implementing the wedges and, and some of your concepts. And uh, it's, a, it's wonderful. So thank you so much, Gary, for coming on the show yes. and, and sharing your work. Yes, and uh, thank you. and uh, we're excited to, excited to you know, continue, continue seeing this combination and what it can do here. So amazing. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, We'll share in the show notes some of the links that Gary mentioned as well, so you can look them up. And that's it for now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Undercurrent Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date as we release future episodes.